My name is Daniel Serwer. I'm a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and I guess the first American you're hearing during this conference. Sign of our times. Let me invite those who are standing to find seats if they'd like. I have a magnificent panel, star-studded panel of political heavyweights, intellectual heavyweights, uh, before you. So I need to lay out some ground rules, lest we be here till midnight. I will start with uh, a round of questions. I will try to tailor a question specifically to each panelist. They will then use my question as they like, but for no more than five minutes. The general theme of this conference has been the question of trust. The uh, organizers saved me a lot of trouble by saying in the introduction to this panel that trust is a problem, that many regional initiatives, there are many regional initiatives, but few tangible results. Just in framing the issues, I want to say that you're entitled to take issue with that premise, as I hope some of you might. It's not only Goran Zvilanovic who makes his living on uh, regional initiatives, but last night I had a bit of a briefing on the sub-regional arms control agreement, for example, which was originated at Dayton, but which continues to live beyond it. So you can take issue with that premise. You can also take issue with the premise that trust is the problem. Because I wonder sometimes whether trust really is the problem. You know each other extraordinarily well. Some of you can remember when you used to live in the same country. Is leadership the problem? Is imagination the problem? Is analysis the problem? Knowledge, initiative, resources, institutions. There are a lot of potential problems besides trust. And I'd like to know where you think the big problems are, and most importantly, how you think they can be overcome. I'm going to do this in something like alphabetical order. The organizers gave me a list in alphabetical order, and I find that much easier to keep track of. Uh, so, Mr. Foreign Minister, Deputy, Foreign, Deputy Prime Minister Dacic, let me start with you. You are a chief negotiator of the belgrade pristina Agreement of 2013. What did you learn in that process that we can apply elsewhere about getting to yes, getting past mistrust, which was certainly deep in that case, to something like a mutually satisfactory agreement? Pošto sam znao da Daniel neće da se drži ovaj since I knew that Daniel is not going to stake what uh, has been announced, uh, in order for me not to make a mistake, I'm going to speak in Serbian. But at the same time, I will speak uh, Croatian and also Bosnian and Montenegrin language. So all of a sudden we became people who speak uh, various languages by birth itself. 
smatram da moram da ne zaboravim to, pošto sam se za to pripremao za temu evropske integracije i tako dalje. Mislim da Evropska unija, da pošto je to citirao moj kolega u Berlinu, Angeli Merkel je rekao jednu divnu rečenicu, svi su se smijali, samo što nije rekao da sam ja autor te rečenice. I don't want to forget this, so I will divert from the topic for a second. I wanted to say something about EU integration and I will quote my colleague. This is something that he told at the Berlin conference to Angela Merkel, but he forgot to mention that I was the originator and author of this sentence. Tako da se zna da sam ja to rekao. So I want to know that everyone knows that I said this. Da je Evropska unija popularnija na Zapadnom Balkanu nego u Evropskoj uniji. I said that the European Union is more popular in the Western Balkans than in the EU itself. Kako su tekli pregovori sa Tačijom? How did the negotiations with Tači go? Prvo, first of all, Bilo je problema da li ćemo da se rukujemo ili nećemo da se rukujemo. The first problem is whether we are going to shake hands or not. Da li ćemo da se slikamo ili nećemo da se slikamo. Whether we are going to take a picture or not. Catherine Ashton je tek posle nekoliko dana objavila sliku. Catherine Ashton published this picture a few days after it really was taken. I moram da kažem da sad mi je žao jer Više moji susreti sa njim nisu istorijski događaj. And I have to say that I regret that my meetings with him don't have a historical significance anymore. Evropska unija je bila iznenađena, pa i sama Catherine Ashton, koja se veoma brzo snašla i kojoj dugujemo veliku zahvalnost. The EU was surprised and Lady Catherine Ashton, of course, was surprised as well. And she really got the grip of it. And I have to say that we are very thankful to her for all the efforts. Bila je iznenađena načinom na koji smo razgovarali. She was surprised by the manner that these talks and this dialogue was held. Da li je bilo lako? Nije. Was it easy? I have to say no. Ali je najlakše bilo razgovarati na najvišem nivou. But the easiest thing was to have a dialogue at the highest level. Radne grupe nisu nikad mogle da postignu ni jedan dogovor. Task forces were never able to reach any kind of agreement. Uvek je ostajalo, ostavit ćemo to za sastanak na vrhu. Their notion was just leave these issues for the high level meetings where they are going to be solved. I nije bilo lako donositi odluke. And also it wasn't easy to make decisions. Mi smo imali, ovde je i gospodin Marko Đurić, on je i tada bio u sastavu delegacije, sada je on šef naše kancelarije koja se bavi Kosovom. Bilo je veoma važno doneti političku odluku, hoćemo li to ili nećemo. Here with me is Marko Đurić. He was part of the delegation during the dialogue and now he's in charge of the office for Kosovo. And at that time it was very difficult to make and bring a political decision whether we are going to make this possible and plausible or not. Mi smo potpisali briselski sporoz. We signed the Brussels agreement. Možda u tom momentu je bilo velikih dilema da li to treba ili ne. At that moment there was a great dilema whether this should be done or not. Bilo je razmišljanje o tome kakva će biti naša politička budućnost pojedinačno. And also at that time the dilemma was what is going to be a political future for each of us individually. Ali... However, ja sam od uvek govorio i to sada mislim da je jedna od glavnih pouka. I was always advocating and I think this is one of the major lessons learned. Kardinal Rišelje koji nije bio sklon kompromisima i nije poznat po tome je uvek govorio da je kompromis ona vrsta dogovora u kojoj svako dobija pomalo od onoga što nije želao. 
Cardinal Richelieu, who was not very renowned for being a person who makes compromises, always said that a compromise is a notion or a state where everyone gets a bit what they do not want. Poruka je da je neophodna politička volja za bilo kakav veliki iskorak. Uh, the message was that uh, there needs to be a political will if you want to make a step forward. Potrebna je politička svest o tome šta je neophodno uraditi da bi se iskoračilo, da bi se krenulo dalje. Uh, there needs to be a political state of mind which is going to make you know and realize what is needed to be done and what is going to make you progress. I... Sreo sam nedavno u Berlinu pre neki dan Tačija u hotelu. I recently met at the Berlin's Congress Mr. Tachi in a lobby of the hotel. I nismo se sreli sa njim od, od aprila meseca. And I have to say that uh, I saw him last in April since ne then. Ne se da li će ko će formirati vladu u Prištini. Uh, it's not certain who is going to form the government in uh, Pristina. Ja kad sam ga sreo, rekao sam mu, rekao sam mu, nedostajete nam. And when I met him, I told him, we miss you. Nemamo s kim da vodimo dialog. There is no one to have a dialog with. I baš zato mislim da je ono što je pre dve, tri godine izgledalo nezamislivo, mislim da smo mi uspeli da uradimo. And it is important that uh, what uh, two or three years ago seemed impossible is now our reality. Thank you very much. Senatore Benedetto della Vedova. Italy is the nearest neighbor of more Balkan countries than any other single country. There's great doubt now about the European Union, the prospect of European Union membership for the Balkans countries. What can you tell us about the process of accession and the political commitment that the Union has made that will make the European magnet real to people in the Balkans. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, this morning, our uh, Foreign Affair Minister, uh, Madame Mogherini, was in Brussels on behalf of the Italian EU Presidency for the moment uh, in the European Parliament Foreign Affairs Committee and confirm the commitment of the Italian presidency uh, to improve, to accelerate the process of EU integration of the whole Balkan region. This is our commitment, and th we think that this must be the commitment of EU in the future. And we have heard about the negotiation between uh, Serbia and Montenegro. And I want to refer to that negotiation to explain one of the reasons because we as Italian, as EU presidency, think that the process, EU process is important for the stabilization of the entire region. Uh, we think that what is going on, what, the, 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 the negotiation uh, between uh, Serbia and Montenegro is one of the best examples about the normalization in the relationship, in the relationship between Belgrade and Pristina due to the EU prospect, due to the EU integration process. 
I hope, of both countries, but now due to the EU process of integration of Serbia. So that for us is one of the main reasons we push the Balkan uh, integration in uh, EU. Uh, in my political background, uh, at the beginning of my career, political career, uh, in the second half of 80s, uh, me and people that were with me discussing of uh, the future of EU, and we thought at that time that uh, we thought, okay, we need Yugoslavia at that time in EU. Uh, unfortunately, at that time it was not possible, of course. And then we have the 90s in the uh, Balkan area. But I think that in the coming 10 years or something more, maybe, we must have Balkan region, all the countries of the Western Balkans uh, in EU. I, I think is a, an opportunity for the, all the countries in the Western Balkans, the members, the EU membership. But I think that is a need for EU. And as I Italian citizen, before to be an Italian member, uh, a member of the Italian government, we know perfectly that the border of EU, the Balkans, the Western Balkans, are the border of EU. And what I want to say in conclusion, also having in mind the Ukrainian crisis, we need to have our border safe and secure and we need uh, and we think that balkans must not be any more uh, on the border of eu must be a part of uh, a part of eu and I, I think we have to exploit this momentum of attention to what is going on on the, bo on the border of eu because things are moving are moving very fast, sometimes are moving in the right direction, sometimes are moving in a bad direction, and we both, EU and the countries in the Western Balkans, must do our best, I, I, I mean the government, uh, to get things moving in the good and in the best direction, that means to go farther in the EU process of enlargement. I know that it's a sensitive issue in many European countries. It's not so, so easy nowadays because of the economic crisis and a lot of things. But having in mind, not tomorrow, but Europe and Western Balkans in 10, 20 years, I think that we must work to have no border, but a complete union. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Senatore. Marco Makovets. Slovenia has been in the EU now for 10 years. And for some of that 10 years, it might have liked to think that it had left the Balkans behind. If I understand correctly, that's no longer the attitude. But let me ask you what you can do concretely to help with regional cooperation. What do you think the countries of the Balkans need that you can somehow offer? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> if I may first refer to what Minister Dacic said when he started with memories. Uh, I also have one memory on similar negotiations on a very tough issue, uh, which we had uh, on border issue with, uh, with Croatia. Um, and if I may add something to you, Mr. Uh, Minister, you said we need political will and political sense. I would say we also need political courage. It's essential. 
In our case, we had it. And out of the two countries who shared a um, serious open issue, we have come to two countries who share experience in a common initiative uh, with which we want to help all the countries from Western Balkans to progress and to stabilize. Through this initiative, I'm speaking about Birdo process, Birdo Brioni, as we call it uh, this time in Dubrovnik. Uh, first, we want to encourage the political dialogue between the countries. Why? In order to achieve trust, not only among the top politicians, but also among the people who help uh, create the public opinion or who help or insist politicians. Um, but what concrete can Slovenia do? Uh, if you allow me, I would just remember a couple of things. During the Slovenian presidency to the EU in 2008, Slovenia started with, the, or was one of the leading countries who, who conducted the visa liberalization process, finalized by our member of European Parliament, uh, Tanja Fajon. After that, with um, successful fulfillment or successful uh, resolvance of the border issue, Slovenia also assisted um, in great deal to Croatia to become a member state. So what would be the next step? The next step would be to share our experience, to share our knowledge, to share our contacts we have in, in Brussels with the countries which are now approaching to the EU. I would share uh, entirely what uh, what uh, Vice Minister de la Vedova said, um, the European project can be finalized only or realized only when all of, the or all of the countries from Western Balkans will become members of the EU. Why we need that as European Union? I believe that European Union, if managed to include all the countries into the, the community, into the Union, will get additional uh, credibility in the international arena additional credibility needed in this global world. And that's, that is where we, where we started our idea uh, on debate on the summit of, of um, the Birdo process. Trying to, trying to raise the attention on the, on the Balkans once again. We, were, we have all faced, um, I wouldn't call it a, a enlargement fatigue, but some sort of lack of intention on the region for the last couple of years. And that's why the meeting of the heads of states of all Western Balkans countries, plus France, last year in, in Slovenia, was extremely important because it gave a strong signal to the European Union. Here we are, uh, two countries of the European Union, so Croatia and Slovenia, together with the countries uh, and with France, uh, are willing, are capable of uh, conducting a good dialogue and can lighten the potentials which this, uh, which this region have. The next stage or the next step was even more important when we had Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, joining us in, in Dubrovnik. And I believe there will be also next future steps uh, in, in this common initiative, which I hope will be, will, will, how to say, spread out of Slovenian creation into a regional uh, initiative and all the other countries will be will be will will join and host the the big summits um, why i think it is important right now to to focus again on on the western balkans we have two sensitive um, area of of sec well security risks right now one is ukraine and the other one is middle east the Instability can easily be exported into the region if it's not stabilized. If it's stabilized, this spillover effect can be prevented. And how can the region be stabilized? I think by including it into the European Union. We have quite a good framework for that. It's called negotiation process. But there are some countries in the region, I believe, who mainly because of the conflicts in the 90s, need a little bit more than just a technical exercise. Uh, some sort of political tools additional to, to the negotiation process. EIS has proven very efficient in the dialogue of Belgrade and Pristina, which, if I may once again use this opportunity and, and congratulate to Minister Dacic for his engagement. That was really a, a, a big, event, a big uh, achievement. But some sort of good practices from this dialogue should and could be used also in other in other sensitive open issues or open questions which we have in the region. 
And this, is, this would be my final answer to, to your question. Trying to use the good practices from the EU institutions, from the countries, and combine and try to seek for the solutions for the remaining open issues. Because with solving the remaining open issues, the countries of the region will progress much faster on their path to the EU and will come closer to the EU much faster. Thank you, Marco. Ambassador Alexander Andrea Pejovic, you're negotiating EU membership right now. You're the guy on the spot for Montenegro. What can you tell us about this process? Uh, and what kind of help would you need from the region or would you appreciate from the region? Or do you think the region's irrelevant? Do you think uh, this is mainly a Podgorica Brussels negotiation and forget the rest? Thank you, Daniel, for this question because um, I would like to give you a kind of a view from Montenegro, from Podgorica as a smallest member of the region. And also, as you said, the one negotiating for the membership. We are now the, at the forefront of the negotiations in, in, the, in the Balkans with the one-third of chapters already opened and two closed, which means that we are deeply inside of the negotiating process. That we can already say how much we actually used uh, the experience from the region, from the neighboring countries, and how we actually experience this regional approach to things. Obviously, we never tried to do it alone. We, from the very beginning, um, um, uh, uh, tried to use the experience of our predecessors, uh, uh, foremost Slovenia and Croatia. We, for example, when we created the negotiating structure, we immediately went to Zagreb to see how they did it and uh, which models they applied because the Croats had the, the, the freshest example of how to negotiate. And Vesna knows that even through their center of excellence today, we have a um, weekly cooperation uh, where we exchange experts and we really get the expertise coming from, flowing from Zagreb to Podgorica and, and, and vice versa. With Slovenia, for example, we established a kind of a fund from the Slovenian and Foreign Ministry, which helps us on also on a weekly basis. We voice our demands on the experts and then get the expertise flowing to the, to the country in trying to do things not, not by ourselves, but seeing what the neighbors did. Because you have to bear in mind that the countries, we, as, as the countries coming or stemming from the same federation, we share the same legal background. And obviously, when you want to introduce the acquis, you, you share the experience with the closest uh, countries that actually did the same things. In many regards, it has uh, proven to be not just helpful, but, uh, but uh, critically crucial for the success of negotiations. And the more we actually talk to the other countries um, in the region, uh, the better we were in negotiating uh, preparations. But I think that there is no single European um, uh, country sitting here in the, in the, represented by, um, uh, by uh, here in the room that we have not cooperated in this uh, two and a half years of negotiations. We have really done uh, taxes, twinnings, and uh, bilateral cooperation with uh, uh, all of the EU countries and managed actually to use the European integration as a kind of a tool mechanism to boost bilateral cooperation. So in our case, because we are a, a young country, eight years old, we use the integration both in NATO and the EU to improve the bilateral ties where they were missing. Uh, prior to this, we never had very direct links, for example, with Ireland or Finland or, or the Baltic states. Then the, uh, the second issue I wanted to, to, to say is uh, the trust that we have been mentioning for the last two days in, at the BLED conference. And the trust here is a, uh, is a crucial denominator because without the trust, we cannot do anything in the region. It, mean, it means that we are in the same boat from our side, we never thought that we are an island, we are not Malta or we are not um, Iceland to negotiate separately. So we always thought of sharing and uh, taking experience from the others, but also seeing how our neighbors can progress. Because without the progress of the region as a whole, we cannot expect to have um, uh, the, the whole area finally stabilized and within the Euro European Union at, at one point. This is also not just at the high political level, it's also very daily, uh, practical use. You know that the Croat entry created lots of problems for the Bosnian producers of meat, milk, and, 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 and food um, um, industry. In the same case, if we join alone, obviously it will create problems with trade in the region, getting out of SEFTA and so on. So uh, the idea is really to try to cooperate already now, with, and not just to show how we can actually exchange experience, but also to show to the, uh, our future, let's say, colleagues in the European Union that we can um, work at the, on the same basis as the European Union uh, works. 
And the final point comes back to the regional cooperation as such as the mechanisms, and maybe Goran can give us, um, will probably give us a, a better explanation on how the regional mechanisms work, whether they are adequate or not. Because uh, ever since the SECP started in the early 90s and we had um, kind of um, transformations through the Stability Pact and now something over 40 regional initiatives that are working in the, in the Western Balkans, um, we have been trying to find um, uh, always better and better ways of uh, how to cooperate. And obviously there are lots of people who would say they are not satisfied, that this is not enough, that, and, and therefore in the last year or so we have had a number of new initiatives springing out. We have the Western Balkan 6, we have the Berdobri Uni process, we have the Berlin conference just a few days ago, we'll have the next one in, in Austria and in France. Uh, which shows that there, are, there is a need of uh, new mechanisms and new kind of tools in how to actually improve, uh, uh, first of all, the political solu solutions for the region, and then, of course, economic development and infrastructural connectedness. Uh, connectedness. Uh, this means that, uh, obviously, uh, we have to address these three issues in order to um, really work better on the uh, integration in the European Union and thus create results. So, to answer your questions, of course, yes, uh, we cannot go alone, we are not pretending to be uh, a separate case, but uh, obviously the approach of you, which is based on the individual merits, is the basis of the success within the negotiation. So in the end, um, we are not going to wait for the others, but we are not going to uh, say that we, are not doing, that we are doing this alone. So in any case, we are trying, and I think we are already trying to transmit this knowledge that we have accumulated in the past two and a half years, because for example, with the Serbian negotiating team, we have uh, almost daily communication on many issues. And uh, we have had a number of conferences and seminars taking place either in Montenegro or Serbia, in which we explain the new approach on the rule of law or what we did with this chapter on that chapter. And obviously, with the rest of the countries in the region, we are ready to, to do the same once they, they start negotiating. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Foreign Minister Nikola Popovsky. Macedonia finds itself in an awkward spot because of its the, the so-called name issue. I don't have an issue, but some other people do. And those other people are blocking membership in NATO quite actively. And they've blocked uh, EU accession negotiation as well. Are you able to overcome those disadvantages? Are you able to cooperate with NATO in an effective way? Are you able, through the high-level dialogue, to begin your preparations for European Union membership? And in the end, how do you see the resolution of the long-standing, decades-long name issue? I have to say that Daniel Server never stops surprising me. I, I was hoping for two good news, and I got scared, scared twice before starting my, uh, my presentation. The first time was in the way that you asked question Marco by saying Slovenia has been in the European Union for 10 years. I was expecting you're going to ask him, when is he going to get out of it? So I really got scared. <laughs> The second time was that I was hoping that I'm not going to get the name issue on the plate, but obviously it's unavoidable considering the reality. Still some good news, I would say, um, um, and, and some positive perspectives. And they can be only given from a historical point of view. We were, I think each one of us, each, each one of the nations that are represented on this panel, in the business of correcting historical injustice. That was the case for Macedonia, it was the case for Slovenia, it was the case of Serbia, Montenegro, you name it. Everybody was correcting a historical injustice that happened in the past. And I think that that was probably, in, including the one intellectual, on intellectual property rights, whether it concerned the IVAR or it concerned who quoted uh, the, the, the evaluation on EU popularity first. Uh, but all these things were about correcting some of the injustice that happened to us in the past. <laughs> a payback <laughs> and um, and I think that um, that was probably um, a common denominator for a region and that was the dividing line that we all suffered from including those that are in the European Union that does not 
uh, mean that our uh, Greek uh, friends, for example, are excluded from that rule of correcting historical injustice that is perceived. But I would leave that to theologists to discuss about who has suffered most of uh, injustice in the past. I was more focused on um, uh, 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 the fact when, whenever we discuss this regional cooperation, we associate it with the trust. And that really matters. A quick chat with our Mexican friends was a wake-up call to me before this conference. We were discussing covering embassies and having here and there. One would assume that, well, Macedonia, Mexico, besides the alphabetical order, and that we both have an important U.S. diaspora, what kind of connection can you have? So we tried to build it. One of them was, where do you cover the country from? And where do you have an embassy? And Mexican friends have told us that they think in regional terms about opening embassies. So they try to cooperate with uh, Chile, with other countries from Latin America, etc. I mean, come on. For a Macedonian, that's a wake-up call. A country of 120 million, probably the fastest growing uh, emerging economy, petrol exporter, thinks in regional terms when they're talking about covering countries. We are two million people. Most of us don't have a budget to cover a few dozens of, of, of embassies, and we haven't reached the stage of having that kind of concept. So probably that is a picture about us and thinking about how do we handle these things uh, domestically. On the positive side, I would say people from outside see us as a, uh, as a whole. I haven't met a single person so far coming outside of the region that didn't have two, two points of discussion when we met. One was Greece, Daniel had a good guess. The other one was region. So they ask, what's going to happen? How do you plan to handle these things? And uh, what about your neighbors, etc.? Most of people we talk, with, we talk with think that we have the same mentality and think that, they are, that we are pretty much the same. Whether you take it as a compliment or as a critical point, that's a fact. <laughs> this is how they see us. And trust has changed. So we are not anymore in this historical background of, of um, historical injustice being corrected. And there are at least two things that are very good indicators. One, defense spending. Bad news for Cardiff, if we talk to our NATO friends. The good news is that everybody in this region is decreasing his defense funding, which means that they're not under threat. At least, that's the perception. The second thing, business. I think in Macedonia, in terms of more than half of everything we do is within, with the neighbors of ours, including Greece, coming to your question. And Germany is another quarter. So practically everything we do business-wise is region and Germany. That's about it. Uh, confidence building helps. A good indicator is that more than half of our population is spending holidays in Greece, besides the problem that we're having. And still, if you ask me, do we see uh, a, a solution on this um, issue that has been preventing Macedonia from getting into NATO since 2008 and getting into the European Union or starting accession negotiations since 2009, I wouldn't be able to give you a more optimistic assessment than the one that you've heard the last time. But business is going and happening. We massively invade Greek beaches and spending holidays over there. Um, investments and exchanges between people are happening as they have always happened. And I would say that this schizophrenic type of situation can only be corrected by making decisions at the level of both NATO and EU. It's not sending the ball back to the academia, but I think that we need this distance and see that things on the ground are pretty good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam First Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, Vesna Pusic. You have the most recent memory of negotiating EU membership. How has it affected your relations with the non-EU members in the region and how can you help them to move forward? Thank you very much for your question. And it's great to be here with the colleagues, and thanks for inviting me. Um, as you rightly guessed at the beginning, I'm going to say first a little bit something on something that you didn't ask me, and then come back to what uh, you actually did ask me. 
but it's not completely unrelated since it um, has to do with an issue that you started our panel with, and this is the issue of trust. Um, I must say I don't see trust as a viable political category, and I don't see that as a problem in the region. Um, I see as one of the problems that, or maybe something that's sometimes interpreted as a lack of trust or the need for trust, um, what it is, 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 I think, something, something else. And it's, um, it's a sort of capacity to articulate and understand one's own political interests. And this is something that we are still practicing. And this is something, because when we talk, we, as you said, know each other, know each other political culture, understand the hidden and triple hidden meanings and all of that. Um, what you're not sure is whether your interlocutor actually understands what her or his political interests are. By her or his political interests, I mean the political interests of her or his country. And this is a matter of political rationality, political maturity, which we are still in the process of gaining. And uh, the most sort of dilemmas and the most misunderstandings that I had in dealing, and I personally have advocated regional cooperation long before it became a vogue in the region, when it was completely anathema. Also long before I was in politics, actually, for real. Because I think that this is everybody's rational interest in, in the region. But the most uh, misunderstandings I had was uh, because I guess I wasn't, and also uh, my interlocutors were not sure whether we understood what our political interests were. And uh, if we sort of reached a level where we all had a more or less rational approach to our political interests and understood that and could articulate that, plus, some kind of tacit agreement on sort of what are the what is the common ground what is uh, what you you basically what are the rules that you're you're uh, playing by i think this is what then makes everybody's life easier and what makes uh, regional cooperation productive I would say that in the last 10, 15 years, one of the key and dramatic changes that the region has, has undergone is um, from sort of not accepting, to put it very mildly, regional cooperation or looking at it with great suspicion to advocating regional, uh, regional cooperation Everybody now does this in the region. The question is, um, what do you? What is the content? How how do you actually materialize that? There are some things that are obvious: borders, you know, some of the financial things. Uh, I don't know, legal things that that you have to bring uh, in order which is always difficult, uh, easier to do if you cooperate and if you talk to each other than if you don't. In that sense, <clears throat> this whole EU project is a perfect thing because it's sort of an easy thing on which to cooperate. There is no country in the region that says, no, we don't want any part of that. We don't want to negotiate about membership in the European Union. We don't want to, to go in that direction. On the contrary, and it's not seen as terribly controversial by anybody. And therefore, it's something where it's easier to start 
a tangible cooperation on, cooperation that can produce results where you can uh, do something positive, move forward, where you can get people working, working together. In that sense, um, Croatia obviously thinks, and it didn't always think that, but it thinks that uh, now for quite a number of years, that uh, it's in everybody's interest in the region that all the countries in the region make that transformation and become members. It stabilizes everybody. It's a state-building exercise. It has a lot, of, a lot of positive things. As it was already mentioned earlier, since we share a big part of our political, administrative, and legal history, um, the strategies of um, adjusting to the European legislation, to the European in, uh, institutional infrastructure, and the obstacles are pretty similar. So our experience is useful, usable also by, by all the countries in the region. Uh, by that, I don't mean only Slovenian and Croatian experience, but you know, there are things constantly changing, so it can go back and forth also. In some cases, you know, the country that's negotiating can come up with something that's useful, and it can also be applied in, in uh, some of the other, other countries. I also think that the region, although this is very often sort of considered self-understood, I don't think that the region is ex-Yugoslavia plus Albania. I think that the region is ex-Yugoslavia plus Albania plus Bulgaria plus Romania plus Greece. This is Southeastern Europe. Uh, some countries are members, some countries are not members. The moment you become a member of the European Union, you don't leave the region, although this was also sometimes sort of considered. And I also think that, that um, Achieving the membership for the countries of this small white spot in the middle of this region of countries that are not members yet is not real enlargement. I always thought, and we always thought that this was more a consolidation of the European Union's territory. And one last small remark also related to Italy and, and specifically to Italian Foreign Minister uh, Mogherini and also, as you know, High Representative Designate uh, Federica Mogherini. This is Southeastern Europe. One thing that I have started recognizing in, in Italy's foreign policy and especially in Minister Mogherini's travels in the past few months is that Italy understands that it's also South, not only East. And in that sense, became much more involved in the sort of deliberation of uh, the future of the region. Thank you very much. Goran Svilanovic, you are now Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council, fresh from a triumph in Berlin where your issues got a good deal of attention. So uh, what can we expect of this Regional Cooperation Council in the next few years? What are you going to build? How are you going to improve things? Well, thank you very much for the way you introduced me. I am grateful, and I hope you are right. But let us see, as they would say in India, let us see. Uh, I would dare to say that uh, my personal evaluation of the meeting organized by Germany and the German Prime Minister is that after Thessaloniki and after Croatia's succession to the EU, this is the most important and encouraging event that I've witnessed relevant for the region and its succession to the European Union. Reasons why I'm so optimistic are the following. First, there have been three different gatherings, prime ministers with prime minister, foreign minister with the foreign minister of the host country, as well as the one I've attended, and this was the ministers of economy who have been gathered by the deputy prime minister of Germany and the minister of economy. And I spoke there together with the commissioner Oettinger, 
who was speaking about energy and I was speaking about the Southeast Europe 2020 strategy, jobs and prosperity in European perspective. That's the official title of the strategy that the ministers around this table and those who are missing have uh, adopted individually, each and every government, plus uh, they've endorsed it last November in Sarajevo as a regional development strategy. And this was brokered, the deal, the process was led by the Regional Cooperation Council. And as you mentioned in the conclusions of the chair of the Berlin meeting, uh, yeah, RCC was pointed out in two out of 18 uh, conclusions. So we've been tasked, so to say, but we've been tasked by these ministers to assist them in what these governments want to do. And this is as it was in the US elections, presidential elections in the 90s, it's all about the economy, stupid, the big and the famous title. Uh, I would actually say that when it comes to these countries and contemporary development, particularly accession process, it is uh, worse than that. It's all about all stupid. When it comes to bringing these countries into the EU, I think that after accession of Croatia to the EU, we are embarking upon, led by Montenegro, followed by Serbia and then the others, into a completely different accession process. And I have two reasons why I claim it is going to be a different one. It's a new phase of accession. One, the EU itself is going to be much different in years than it was years back. The message I've read from European elections only months back, the way I read it is, we're gonna take you in once we see you as equals. That's how I read the statements given by, with votes, by French citizens, German citizens, Slovene citizens. That is the message how I read what they voted in Italy as well, and in other countries, when they were voting for those who will be representing them into the EU. When I say equals, it is economy before everything, but it's also culture. So to see us as equals in economic, social, political terms. The poor truth is that when it comes to GDP, countries gathered here are at the level of below one third or what is the average GDP per capita among the EU28? This is where we are. When it comes to population, all of these, and now I'm addressing countries in the accession process, SAP, the six. They are basically at the level of numbers, Belgium and Netherlands together, people-wise, human capital-wise. When it comes to economic output, GDP, 60% of what is Belgium. As long as this is, and it is true, perceived by the European citizen, they're gonna be very hesitant. Whether they will vote for a politician in Italy who will then support the enlargement process. And therefore, my first message is, we need to win the hearts of the citizens of the EU in order then for them to be the voters supporting those who will be politically driving the process of accession. So this is one, the EU will be different. And two, to be very frank, respecting all six, it is a going to be a specific process because these countries are, they have inherited a specific problem. So you've mentioned name issue, but that's not the only one. Functionality in case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, then I can list, I don't want to list today. Each and every one, in case of Serbia, will. It is advancing because Serbia has found a way, thanks to this and the previous government, these two, uh, to go about Kosovo, and therefore we do have a different process with the chapter 35. I don't know whether the process in each and every case to follow will be a different one. It will, I believe, but we don't know. These are the two groups of reasons why I say we are embarking upon a process which is not only going to last, I don't know how long, but it will be substantially specific compared to what we witnessed in case of Croatia or in case of Slovenia, to mention those uh, here. Therefore, uh, I just want to be very honest, regional 
component is going to be an important one, and this is why I claim the meeting in Berlin was an important one. All of them came. There were no nitty-gritty things between them. It was a clear message. We want to develop and we are requesting your assistance in the process, and we came with the projects. Actually, I have a pile of documents that I received from Albanian Prime Minister and Serbian Prime Minister. And next Friday, I will be in Brussels negotiating only the projects. Because these guys came with the developed ideas, what they want. And I'll give you an example what I picked up, for instance, from the Prime Minister Vucic. Of course, he did have in mind Serbian interest. That's his job. He's paid and voted by his people to do it. But in every project he presented, there was a regional component and regional relevance. I won't go through all, but for instance, he was basically saying what we care for is the railway Belgrade Sarajevo. So of course it's relevant for Belgrade, but it's Belgrade Sarajevo. It's very important for Bosnia and the people living along. And he then said, I want railway Belgrade uh, uh, Bar, which is relevant for Serbia. It's relevant for Montenegro. It's very relevant for Bosnia and Herzegovina again if you look at the map. So what I want to say, that was an encouragement, that all of them came with a clear idea, we want more cooperation. What is the bad news? Bad news is money. If I'm not wrong, the ratio between the debt and the GDP in case of Serbia is 65%, perhaps plus. In case of Croatia, 80% plus. And then if I continue listing, there are better cases, but this is it. They cannot go for a new loans. Or if they do, they have to be very sensitive, very cautious what loans they are asking for and what for. It's going to be uh, difficult. So they came with the idea, they came with the project, but money is not around. Therefore, we do live in a different Europe compared to the 90s and the beginning of the century. And it will continue being very much different. And now I'll close, at least this intro statement. I very much love uh, the, the notion of the Blast Strategic Forum. This is the ninth one. I hope to see you on the tenth one. And I'm grateful to the Slovene Foreign Minister for inviting me. I've attended perhaps not all, but almost all. That you picked up uh, the verbatim, the words of the, the one who I really respect as the best political philosophers from the region and maybe in Europe, Ivan Krastev, who's written a book in mistrust with trust, and it's basically what we are discussing, because he's challenging what kind of democracy will have to respond to the challenges that the people are bringing. We can, well, we are in Slovenia, look back two or three years, what has happened with the governments here, and how much the people influence the process. They've started with the Facebook protests, Twitter protests, and it really influenced. People do not believe anybody. They want to vote for those who they've never seen on the TV. And only they are eligible for the government. Tricky as it is, but it's all about trust. So what I'm saying is we are witnessing a social phenomena in which people are requesting, so Marxist terminology, a new social contract. And they're not followed by intellectual elite who is offering this. Nor they're followed by the new political leadership. It's the same thing, okay, we are going to see elections in Bosnia in a month from now. Same players gonna emerge as the winners, more or less, but that's it. And then we will have to talk to them. So we need to understand that the people protesting in Bosnia only months back will again have to vote, and they will vote, more or less for the same people. Then we'll have to understand we need to talk to what we have. So the challenges are around, and I'm not sure whether we will, and how we're gonna cope with this. We need a support, intellectual support, philosophical support in the new circumstances. This does not go for the region, it goes widely when we discuss Europe. Look at European elections in each and every country. 19%, I'm sorry, Senator, Vice Minister, but in Italy, for whom? in the European elections, most recently, 19%. And what do you do with these 19%? These are the living people who voted. For someone claiming I'm not a politician, and I hate them. And they said, yes, we hate them as well. And then? And then what do you do with this? What I'm saying, it's a challenging process, and it's not typical for any of the countries, it's common. 
and the accession process will have to be led further in order to also support these countries to reform themselves. Reform is going to be much more important whether they will and when they will end into the EU. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Trishish Babic. You didn't have to take so much time. Anna Trishish Babic. Bosnia is a country that most of us see as in need of reform and threatened no longer by the region but by its own internal structure and the difficulties of making it function effectively in a European context. Show us how Bosnia, instead of being a laggard in the region, can become, if not a leader, at least keep the pace with the others. Okay, good afternoon. Well, it was good this job because Goran was so pessimistic at the end that I was thinking what to say, you know, how region will we'll end up and when we will end up. But anyway, well, yes, you are right, everybody, in the region, around the region, see Bosnia and Herzegovina as the, as the biggest problem in the region, and everybody wants to help Bosnia and Herzegovina how to be <laughs> more functional. I will really use this opportunity to thank the Minister Pusic, because the Minister Pusic was the first one coming from the region, being part of the European Union, that gave the concrete proposal in front of the ministers of the European uh, uh, foreign minister of the European Union to find a new approach of accession towards the Bosnia and Herzegovina. As Goran also said, we are going to have elections in a month's time in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and nothing will change. That's, I still don't want to say pessimistic part of the story, but you know, all the political parties, they will all stay somehow in the game in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the, 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 the elections and the system of Bosnia and Herzegovina, you don't have the real opposition in Bosnia and Herzegovina. You know, there are no position, there are no opposition. You have the party who are, who are creating the government because of the interest, because of the numbers. So how uh, uh, to, 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 to find a way for Bosnia and Herzegovina to, uh, as you said, you know, to catch and to be the part of all these regional and European integration processes and to be functional. I think the only way, whatever, and we know the answer from European Union and this uh, attempt of, of Croatia in European Union, still we hope that maybe new commission will uh, again think about this. Bosnia and Herzegovina is the only country in the region that has nothing. Very often I would say that something, this is the situation like a twilight zone. We have everything, but we have nothing. You know, we are talking about European, you know, we are on the table for European uh, uh, Union, we are going now to be the part of integration processes, battling in the huge projects, but we can't even get the candidate status. We are talking about the, 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 the NATO, but we have the map, but we don't have the map. Legally, we are in the map, but we are not implementing map. So this is the very unique even situations in the region. Uh, Montenegro, as you see, Montenegro is negotiating EU, and it's very close, actually, it's finishing the map processes uh, uh, because of the M M Macedonia has the candidate status, and also because of the problems with the Greece, still the situation with the, with the, with the uh, uh, NATO. But they finished all these reforms and processes. Croatia is the full member of the European Union, full member of the, of the NATO, Slovenia, it's also for, for a long time full member of the European. <laughs> we, Serbia has the candidate status, not just the candidate status, Serbia is going to start the negotiations. So we don't have anything in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There are several, or there are lots of the papers circling around between us, you know, what to do, what kind of the approach to fund, and the, the only, the first answer is that politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina, they need, they need to get something. So let me maybe try to think for Bosnia and Herzegovina at least to get this candidate status with special uh, 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 kind of approach during the opening of the process of negotiation and during the negotiations. And was the, this very good paper that uh, the, the Croatian Ministry of Foreign Affairs presented for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Otherwise, unfortunately, nothing, 
Nothing will change in Bosnia and Herzegovina. What is also this status quo situation, it's also dangerous. It's not good, it's not bad, it's not going to be worse, it's not going to be better, it's same. What is striking me, and I think all of us, uh, uh, we were, everybody was mentioning this, the economy situation, first in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as in the region. Very often, I, I think we all, personally, I'm traveling privately, officially, using the highways, Croatia, Zagreb, Belgrade, then our highways are empty. When we are traveling with our highways, you can see maybe 10 tracks. What is telling that our economies are so weak? If you are going around the Bosnia and Herzegovina, no, you know, you have to see cars, no tracks. If you are going deeper in the Serbia, going towards the Macedonia, several times I was traveling, but no tracks. And this is, you know, the, 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 I did this recently, traveling this highway, uh, Banja Luka, Zagreb through Croatia, Slovenia, it's also empty. <laughs> but the, 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 the <laughs> empty, empty on the roads. But you know, the, the picture, when you're entering into, 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 the, into the Austria, when you see the three full of the, then it's telling the, we don't have economy. So how we will start our economies? in such situation. We all know that the last question for all of us, EU and we who wants the NATO, it's our GDP, how we will raise our GDPs. For how long citizens of all these countries will stand this situation? Now I will also come back and yesterday I really enjoyed that. I'm so happy that I was on the opening ceremony uh, 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 listening to the Slovenian president uh, Pahor about what leaders mean. So as our leaders here, saying people what people want to hear, what they think that people want to hear. Are our leaders needs to have responsibility to shape our society and make people? And also about the trust that was, you know, uh, when I've got this, this Blaise Strategic Forum, uh, a papers, leaders, trust, I said, well, what does it mean? But really, the main questions for our region at the moment is, you know, leaders and uh, trust. Also something what we lost in Bosnia and Herzegovina, what is the problem what, with any talks inside of the Bosnia and Herzegovina is trust. We had inside of Bosnia and Herzegovina more trust after the Dayton Agreement than we have now. There are no trust in Bosnia and Herzegovina first between the political readers and you know that is also transferring all, all, on the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you very much. Hoji, uh... You are last but not least in my estimation. America intervened twice definitively in the Balkans in the 1990s. And enough. To <laughs> <laughs> it's a matter of opinion. <laughs> The question is now. We have other problems. We've got Ukraine, we've got the Middle East, we've got the Asia Pacific. What still matters to the United States in the Balkans? And what can we do about it? Thank you, Daniel. Finally, the hour of America has arrived. <laughs> It's great to be here, and thank you for inviting me. And it's, uh, I understand there have been uh, some concerns that uh, no one from the US has uh, intervened up until this point. And it's very refreshing to hear complaints that America has been too silent, because usually we hear the opposite complaint. And I can tell you that there are several diplomats on this stage who can assure you that in all of the countries which they represent, America is very present, and the complaint is not that we don't talk enough, but that we perhaps talk too much, including um, two of the deputy prime ministers on stage, who I will be too diplomatic to say it directly, except perhaps Mr. Dacic, <laughs> who won't hesitate to be direct. But to answer the question, Dan, I think, uh, you know, the Western Balkans remains very important for America. There's, there's no doubt that there's competition in the world for America's attention that, um, crisis management has become a growth market and that there is only a certain amount 
of time that uh, my president and secretary of state can devote to, to each of them. Um, but I think it's relevant, it's very relevant to this question about what makes regional cooperation work, because I think um, in, in the starkest terms we could say that the Balkans, the Western Balkans, are competing for the attention not only of America, uh, but of the European Union, and uh, many organizations which still care very deeply about the Balkans, but might not have the resources and time to deal with them. So it's, it's very important, I think, that we all ask ourselves, how can regional cooperation concerning the Balkans be, be more effective? And to be efficient, um, I've numbered, I have five suggestions. I can see there's at least one of my former students in the audience, so um, there may be a quiz afterwards. The first, um, first recommendation I'd like to make for re regarding how to improve regional cooperation in the Balkans gets to what Dan started with, and that is about results. Uh, there is, in fact, perhaps an argument to be made there's not too little cooperation in the Western Balkans, but there's too much. Uh, as my colleague from Montenegro mentioned, there are a number of regional cooperation fora, mechanisms, processes already in place. Um, he mentioned, I think, 40. An intern in my office did a recent count of 68 organizations whose raison d'etre is to strengthen and improve the regional cooperation in the Western Balkans. And that was just done on Google search. So you can imagine how many there really are. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with having more rather than uh, too few organizations devoted to that cause. But there is also a real opportunity cost involved in trying to follow and support and act within all of those organizations. So I'd make the case that we need to try to be more results focused and to devote our energies to those organizations, to those initiatives which have a clear objective, one that is a, a result. So we've come to the point, I think, often now, as, as all of us on the stage here attend a lot of meetings in which the negotiation over the wording of a communique, communique or declaration becomes the most important result of the meeting. And somehow when we finally negotiate a nice, sternly worded message uh, to a country, an aggressor, or some country that is not uh, abiding by what other countries want, we feel that somehow has achieved a result. In actuality, it is far less, most cases, than what is needed. So we need to examine what exactly is needed in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, I think we don't need a lot more conferences, but we do need to have an effort that will achieve a stable and functional state, able to integrate with Euro-Atlantic institutions. In Macedonia, we need to have a solution to the name issue so that Macedonia can move towards European integration and NATO. In other countries in the Western Balkans, there are equally clear objectives and results we need to address but for a variety of reasons, which the previous speakers have identified, we have either chosen others that are easier to achieve, or we're simply lost in having too many efforts to, to follow. We need, and this leads to my second recommendation, we need to become more selective, not only in the organizations we support for regional cooperation, but the topics which these organizations and we choose to pursue. So I would argue that European Union integration is extremely important, but it is not the only objective. It is not the only result. First of all, because in most cases, for most of the countries involved in the Western Balkans, it's a rather distant prospect. So if we make that the only result, we'll be waiting years in most cases to achieve that result. I would say there are many other issues that need to be addressed on a very urgent basis. Just to give a couple examples, I think most countries of the Western Balkans are beginning to struggle with a new phenomenon, or at least a newly realized phenomenon, of foreign terrorist fighters. Young men who are going to the Middle East, fighting in conflicts, and then returning, returning to the Western Balkans or sometimes to Western Europe. This is a growing problem. And there's very little regional cooperation going on now, I would say almost none, to address this problem. So we need to prioritize, identify what is really crucial to the stability and security of the Western Balkans and address some of these issues as well. The economy, as Goran mentioned, is something that we need greater efforts together in a regional context. 
Energy security is something we're only now beginning to come to terms with as an issue that needs to be followed, an issue that needs to be pursued in a, in a, in a concerted way with real results, not only talking about the goals, but actual infrastructure, funding, preventing bad things from happening as well as good things, making good things happen, that is. Thirdly, similar to the second issue, there needs to be a greater sense of urgency, whether it's EU enlargement, whether it's fighting terrorism, whether it's building more interconnectors, increasing energy security. We've unfortunately reached a point, I believe, where crisis uh, emergencies have become the status quo. So we no longer get excited when there's a crisis because it's, it's normal almost. But unless there's a greater sense of urgency to, for ex example, solving the name issue or making Bosnia-Herzegovina a functional, reasonably normal, stable state, unless we realize these are issues that need to be solved now and not in 10 years or not according to some vague strategic patience policy, we will fail. We will have worse crises. So we need, it, we need a greater sense of urgency for the regional cooperation to be successful. Fourthly, as Deputy Prime Minister Pusic mentioned, uh, there has to be a common analysis or understanding of our uh, mutual interests, common interests. But that's only one ingredient. Obviously, it's easier to cooperate when you all agree. But it's when countries don't agree or when they don't have common interests that regional cooperation is, is most difficult and also the most important. So I would say this fourth ingredient that's often lacking is that of accountability. <coughs> There's too often, I think, of approach to cooperation as a kind of free ride that's enough to show up, to come to the table, to exchange views, to express differences, shake hands, go separate ways. That's not cooperation, obviously. There has to be a sense of responsibility if this cooperation is going to lead anywhere, countries have to realize that coming to the table means that they are ready to negotiate, to solve problems, to compromise. And if they don't, if they fail, there are consequences. I know this is sounding rather American and un-European, but I truly believe that those organizations and those initiatives which are successful are those in which there is common ownership not only a realization of the common interest, but a realization that if there is failure, if parties leave the room without an agreement, there will be consequences. In the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, I know everyone is picking on poor Bosnia-Herzegovina today, but I think it provides a wealth of examples for regional cooperation, so I just want to draw one further one. What do we do if the leaders of the country don't want to move forward, if they prefer the status quo? And we, as members of some kind of regional cooperation forum or process, want to move the country forward. This is a much, much more difficult problem. But we need to find a way to ensure there is shared responsibility for the shared benefits of the cooperation. And that means that we need to hold the parties to that cooperation accountable for their actions. And if they're not acting responsibly, they need to know there are consequences, and there need to be consequences. Lastly, perhaps getting a little bit closer to the theme of the power of trust, um, and as a Californian, I like that theme very much, and I'd say that one thing that is often lacking from regional cooperation, in my experience, is the presence of principles as the basis for that cooperation. Too often, in the recent past especially, we see that regional cooperation or meetings take place on the basis of naked national interest. Uh, the example that comes to mind for me is Ukraine. We have a country that has been violated. Its territorial integrity violated, its sovereignty violated. It's subject to naked aggression. And yet many countries have a hard time agreeing to even basic measures to defend that country. 
If we're talking about regional cooperation, about important matters that face, that, that endanger the stability and security of Europe, we need to be committed to not only upholding the principles and values in our Helsinki Final Act uh, or NATO Charter or whatever organization happens to be the organization in play, not only in paper, in, in theory, but in practice. So I would say as a concluding point that as we move forward in the Western Balkans, we remember that all the efforts that began 20 years ago or longer, whether it's the Dayton Accords or other efforts, the Berto process, all these efforts are based on shared principles and shared values. And it's become, I think, in the past too easy to forget that we need to uphold and defend and protect those values and principles if we're going to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Hoyt. Uh, I'm going to open the floor to comments and questions. I admit to having sold the first two questions at a high price. Uh, the first one uh, to Valentin Insko, who is the high representative in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I invite him to... Uh, somebody have a microphone? Yeah, that's okay if it's working. And um, maybe it's uh, interesting to start a little bit with history and uh, geography, but I will, of course, very brief, not more than two minutes. I am born behind the mountains here, 30 kilometers by car, but maybe 10 kilometers by air. And in 55, when I went to the funeral of my grandfather here in Slovenia, I needed a visa, you know. The times have really changed now. And um, also about, say, fifth, and I heard the first time then, English in my village, because we were under British liberation. Yeah? So international uh, community has a role to play, and it played it in Austria. It liberated my country, it stayed for 10 years, then everything worked well, democracy was firmly rooted, Marshall Plan worked, then it left. I think this is a good model. 50 years ago, Benedetto, there were still bombs in Italy thrown in uh, South Tyrol. Yeah? Uh, now we are all under one roof. Uh, whether it's Bolzano, you know, the, whether it's Meran or Innsbruck, it's four freedoms, it's the same currency. It has completely changed. So Croats in Bosnia or Croats in Split or whatever, in future, this will be again the same situation. Four freedoms and the same currency. I think this is a very interesting and very important perspective. Of course, also all for the Serbs or for Albanians or whatever in the region. It worked in this case, yeah. Or if you look in future, 2015, I don't like to speak too much about history, I think it will be a key year uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We will have a new government at all levels. We will have a new commission um, in Brussels, and we will have 20 years of Dayton. So we have to reflect uh, in 2015. I think despite all the differences in Bosnia-Herzegovina, the local leaders can achieve three or four priorities together. Yeah? Uh, and nobody will be less Bosniak, more, less Serb, or less Croat, or less others. Uh, there's also a category called others, yeah, unfortunately. Um, so this would be Euro-Atlantic integration. Second, it would be economy. What else? Yeah. Thirdly, it would be rule of law. Not very popular in the Balkans, rule of law. And it would be education and reconciliation, very important. We underestimated reconciliation. It worked between France and Germany, but it has, there has to be an active effort. Yeah. Not just it will happen somehow. Yeah. So, and I would say also, uh, it was mentioned uh, by some speakers, functionality. Uh, but of course, international community also could reconsider its approach. Vesna has, for example, made a good suggestion about a special tailor-made approach for Bosnia-Herzegovina. I would personally say early candidate status, late membership, but very important is transition. This is what it's all about. Even in my own country, Austria, it took six years yeah, to be member, another two years for Schengen, so eight years. The transition is important. Yeah. So international community should be more united in future. We are not always. It should be more prescriptive. We are doing it in development aid also, when we say this and this is good. Yeah? And it should be also uh, more robust. In such a way, I think Bosnia-Herzegovina could change uh, the image, the whole bank class as well. And it could be the image of tourism. It could be the image of culture. We have a very vibrant culture uh, in the Balkans. It could be an image of sport. I just mentioned Djokovic. I mentioned the 20th place of Croatia at the World Football Championship, Bosnia-Herzegovina number 19. 
And uh, it could be also ultimately a, a region of biological and organic food, which is now very in uh, in European Union. And it could also be, I'm deeply convinced, a model for good neighborhood. We even have a special word, and all languages are similar. This word is also similar in Albanian even, komšiluk. Komšiluk is very special. It's more than neighborhood. It's something holy, yeah? And I think we can find back to this, uh, to this special neighborhood. It is possible, I think, that we achieve this. We have seen it now during the floods. There was an outbreak of uh, goodwill, of help, uh, from neighbor to neighbor, from Bosniaks, Muslims, if you like, uh, to Serbs, and vice versa. And especially we have a wonderful young generation, which is still ready to stay in Bosnia and in the Balkans. But if the situation will not change, 70% would like to leave. I think we as international community have a responsibility to give these young people also a chance. And I think everybody here is ready to cooperate. And then we will see very soon a different Southeastern Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valentin. Uh, Oleg Levantin, if you are here. Then I'll give away the, the, the second question, please. Professor Mircea from the University of Skopje. I have a question for the Can senator. Can you speak more closely into the yeah. microphone, please? I have a question for the senator. Senator, uh, you were quite right saying that uh, the assumption in Italy and uh, in the European Union that the candidacy status of Serbia and opening the negotiation will uh, make much easier and facilitate the talks with the Kosovo and the solution of the problem. I fully agree with that. However, why this assumption doesn't apply to the Macedonian case? Many of us are sure that if Macedonia are given the terms of negotiations, that the problem of the uh, name with Greece will be solved much easier. Thank this you. This is the question. Senator, and, uh, regarding you are challenged. Why shouldn't Macedonia enter negotiations and then solve the name problem? Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think you know exactly why. Uh, uh, we are we are pushing, uh, and we are trying. I, I was in Brussels chairing the EU Macedonian uh, Forum uh, Forum uh, Council uh, with with the Commissioner for Enlargement. We were there. Uh, speaking not by myself, but uh, from the EU presidency, we are pushing the process. I think that uh, the, now the order is first solve the name issue, then go ahead with the process. Uh, I think that the, if there is the political will to solve the problem, you can do first the, the name, solve the name issue and then start, it's not a problem. We need the political commitment from each part involved. We're, we're back to where involved. Minister Dacic started, I'm afraid. We need the political commitment. Uh, I'm looking at Brian Bergan to see if I have a couple of more minutes or not. <laughs> <laughs> May I say something? I must. Ja moram da kažem u ime u ime svih ovde ovih koji sede iz bivše Jugoslavije. I must say something on behalf of all the persons present here from the former Yugoslavia. Mislite šta hoćete o bivšoj Jugoslaviji? You may think whatever you please uh, about former Yugoslavia. Ali ona je bila sinonim i pojam za zapad u odnosu na Litvaniju, Letoniju, Estoniju, Češku, Poljsku, Slovačku, Mađarsku, Rumuniju i Bugarsku. 
uh, but it was a role model uh, for Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, the uh, Czech Republic, the synonym for the West. Uh, Serbia, naravno tad nije, po, ajde, da, Jugoslavia, nikad nije bila deo istočnog bloka. Sir, uh, Yugoslavia has never been a part of the Eastern Bloc. Danas me je sremota što mi nismo članica Evropske unije, a te zemlje jesu. Today I am ashamed that we are not members of the EU but those countries are Ali znate kako members. kažu postoji jedan, jedna, jedna anegdota But there is an anecdote Svake godine su vas zvali na neku proslavu pa vas jedne godine ne pozovu i kažu znate nismo vas pozvali jer prošle godine iz vas, apartmana gde ste vi bili je nestao jedan neki srebrni nakit Uh, for example, they invite you uh, to a certain celebration or anniversary each and every year, but uh, one year they omit to invite you. And they say, oh, well, the last year that we invited you, some of the silver jewelry has uh, disappeared. And then you say, I did not steal this for sure. Pa znamo mi da niste, mi smo našli to posle, ali ostao je loš utisak. And they say, oh yes, we are sure that you didn't, but the bad impression remained. <laughs> Prema tome, ja pozdravljam mog prijatelja Hojta. So I želim... have uh, to say, Greet my friend, uh, Mr. Hoyt. I želim da mu kažem da mi hoćemo da popravimo taj loš utisak. And I want to tell him that we want to repair this bad impression. I da mu, ka I da mu zapretim. And to warn him. Ako nas ne prime u Evropsku uniju. If they uh, don't let us into the European Union. Mi ćemo svi da tražimo da uđemo u United States of America. We will all want, we will all ask to become members of the United States of America. <laughs> Well, <laughs> there, there's a solution to all of our problems. <laughs> That's pretty serious. <laughs> uh, I'm tempted to turn back to the panel. You've, you, you've been very patient hearing each other. And I wonder whether any members of the panel have some final thoughts that they'd like to offer besides becoming members of the United States. <laughs> Hoyt will take that proposition back to Washington and see how it's received. Uh, are there others who have thoughts they'd like to offer? Nikola. Just, just one quick comment, which was going along the lines of not forgetting where we started from, and that we still have some principles and values that we stuck in our agenda. You've asked me about name issue, and there was certain comments that were made on that thing. Uh, and I quite often hear when we are discussing these things, well, you know, this is the real world. There are guys that are in, there are guys that are out, and those that are out have to fulfill the, the expectations of those, those that are in, no matter whether they're right, they're wrong, it's outside the values and principles of what we said. You're in, and you can dictate the rules. So I would like, once again, to take these thoughts back to home, and when we are encouraging countries to have political will, to find solutions, etc. And when we think in terms of solutions, to think also about the values and principles that we have put forward in both families, NATO and EU, and then think about it when we think about the solutions. Thank you very much. Yes, I have uh, I, often, I often point out that there's a state of New Mexico, and, and Mexico's official name is Estados Unidos Mexicanos. Uh, think about that. Um, I'm going to turn the baton back over to Brian Bergant, who will introduce the foreign minister, our host. Ministries, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the Blade Strategic Forum, I would like to thank the moderator and the panelists for this interesting panel. The last panel once again highlighted the importance of enhancing trust with the goal of achieving effective regional cooperation in the Western Balkans. 
I'm confident that the Blaise Strategic Forum has given everyone the opportunity to participate and convey their viewpoints. Today, we can undoubtedly claim that the quality of the panel discussion was high, raising awarenesses of the address topics and generating lots of innovative ideas, and that the 2014 Blade Strategic Forum was a great, enriching learning and knowledge sharing event. Allow me to express my appreciation to all of you and everyone who participated at the forum. Great thanks go to the panelists, moderators, high-level guests, business people, young leaders, the representatives of academia, the media, and all of those who made this forum yet another success. This event would not be possible without excellent collaboration and help from our colleagues for the Government Communication Office, the Security and Protection Center, the Minister of Defense and the Slovenian Armed Forces, as well as the Protocol of the Republic of Slovenia, the Ministry of Economic Development and Technology, and Agency Spirit Slovenia. <coughs> Many thanks go also to our co-organizers, their entire team from the Center for European Perspective, as well as to all of my co-workers at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and our volunteers. Last but not least, I would like to thank sincerely to the BSF core team, to Timote, Jernea, Žiga, Alenka, Tina, Urška and Neža. I must not forget Minister Rijavec, who offered strong support from the very beginning and during the entire period of preparations. My heartfelt gratitude and warm thanks to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, Lonely Planet describes Blit as a magical place, one that everyone should visit at least once a lifetime. I will allow myself to go a step further. With its fairy tale lake and castle, its alpine setting, and now the traditional Blade Strategic Forum, Blade is so enchanting that everyone should visit it at least once a year. <laughs> Therefore, I ask you to kindly take out your smartphone and already today save 31st of August and 1st of September 2015 as the date of the Jubilee 10th Blade Strategic Forum. Now I have the honor to invite our host, my boss, Foreign Minister Karel Ryavets, to join me at the stage and deliver his closing remark. Please, Mr. Minister. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and friends of the Blade Strategic Forum. In closing of the 9th Blade Strategic Forum, I would like to thank all eminent speakers, moderators, and participants for all your valuable contributions. The forum would not be such a success without your inputs, perspectives, and open discussion. All platforms of the forum proved the importance of the power of trust. Trust is essential for solving global challenges of our time and for our welfare. In this aspect, I would like to render to the discussion on the last panel, it addressed the question of regional cooperation in Western Balkans. The Slovenian position on the subject is clear. We trust and strongly support the countries of the Western Balkans and their aspiration for the Euro-Atlantic integration. Their place is in the European family where we share common values and principles. But we need to further enhance the trust in the region and regain the power and strength of regional cooperation. Here, I have to point to the Bordeaux process, which is one of the driving forces for future development and prosperity of the entire region. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you once again for being part of this year's Blade Strategic Forum. It has been great to listen to speakers from different backgrounds, from politicians to business people and young leaders. I was pleased that the main messages are optimistic, despite the mistrust in these challenging times. I believe that main message of this year's forum 
brings an answer that almost all challenges can be resolved by the power of trust. At this point, I would like to thank our sponsor and partners, the companies that have remained our loyal supporters. My sincere thanks go to our three strategic partners, BMW Group Slovenia, Generali and Rico. Finally, my special thanks go to the entire Bled Tragic Forum team and all who were involved in making this year's forum successful. I thank you for your support and trust in the forum. I hope to see you back here next year on the 10th edition of Bled Strategic Forum. Thank you and all the best.